A model's well-being in the fashion industry is not a new topic. Ethical charters going beyond BMI standards have been around for many years and more companies have taken action. But recent exposure of mistreatment, harassment, and exploitation by casting directors, agents, photographers have increased the urgency of addressing health and well-being in the modeling industry. In this next session, we will learn more about how to live up to these ethical standards. Please welcome Edie Campbell, model and active voice, Sarah Ziff, founding director, Models Alliance, Marie-Claire Davo, CSO of Car Caring, and casting director, James Scully, who will moderate the session, which should be a very, very good one. Thank you very much. grab my glasses. Um, thank you, everyone, um, and thank you, panel. Um, I just want you to know that when we first came up with this idea, you were the only three people I thought of, so there was no plan B, so I'm very happy to have you here. And also to tell you that um, be careful what you post on social media or you might wind up hosting one of these forums, which I wasn't expecting. But um, this is my first one, so be patient with me. I will try to be as cool, calm, and collected as possible. But um, to start, um, in the last 10 years, every level of the fashion industry in their search for constant newness has created a culture much like fast fashion brands. It cycles through models as quickly as inexpensive t-shirts. Recently, a new power structure evolved with a monopoly of industry veterans making creative decisions for multiple publicly owned brands on every level of their business. With this new absolute power, it created monsters and a fear-based culture of systematic verbal and sexual harassment in which its main victims are the most crucial to the business, models. Their numbers have exploded into an unsustainable, unregulated, and underage workforce from around the world that's neither prepared mentally or physically for its demands. What we're now expecting is a primarily teenage workforce to do the job of adults and pressuring them like adults with outdated systems that don't apply to children, nor does it protect them from the unrealistic speed of creating constant content for a voracious culture of image-hungry consumers. Models who fail to comply with these new rules suffer the termination of their careers, making this workforce vulnerable and open to abuse on a daily basis. And this abuse has now become normalized industry-wide. 18 months ago, I made a call to arms for the industry to hold a mirror up to itself and be more responsible for the human cost of its abuses. If I was ignored, I would start holding the abusers accountable. I was met with industry-wide silence, and true to my words, I took to Instagram and started to call them out one by one. The response was immediate. Not only did it open the door to address the abuse head-on industry-wide, but it also led to the creation of the caring LVMH charter. With the arrival of Me Too, it could not have been more timely, and it swiftly brought these issues to light, and for demand of action to be taken. As we sit here today, the fashion industry is currently in the midst of its own Me Too moment, led by models who have finally been given a voice and have come forward to speak of their abuses using social media, ending the careers of some of fashion's most iconic photographers, stylists, and top executives, and forcing us to realize that it's time for the industry to move forward and is no longer tone deaf to the needs of its workforce. My first question goes to panelist Edie. Um, and my question to you is that um, since the business of modeling and its notion of happiness and glamour depends on the desirability and objectification of your body for employment, I feel that models are not the most, they're not the first people that receive mass outpourings of public sympathy when it comes to abuse. Mm. Um, that because you're beautiful and that people associate your life with the pictures, your suffering is less valid than anyone who works in entertainment, a corporate structure, or a fast food chain. Can you dispel the, daily no the notion of that with some of the daily hurdles that are faced by you or that you've witnessed in the business uh, recently? So, yeah, I think you're right that models are not... It's very difficult to be sympathetic towards somebody who you can see has had fame, fortune, success from a young age, or you might perceive to have receive those things. Um, but I think what's lost is the realization that those young men and women are often 17, maybe younger, very far away from home, um, don't speak English, are in debt, have taken a massive financial risk themselves in starting this career, and often have been sold a dream that will never come to reality. Um, so you're sort of kind of so there's that to consider, and then the other thing to consider is that when you when you go on set and when you go go and start shooting or you're doing a show, you immediately 
the instant you walk through those doors, you immediately hand over your body and your face, and you remove yourself from within that, and your body is the thing that you're selling, and you hand it over to the people that you're working with, and for that day, it is theirs. So what you rely on is their understanding of that trade-off and the fact that they will be respectful and um, behave properly towards you in that way. Um, so when you combine that with the fact that there's also a massive age gap between you and the people you're working with, it's a, you're in a very vulnerable position as a young model, particularly at the beginning of your career. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it I've lost my train of thought slightly. Um, so, yeah, there's a real, there's a real abuse of power. And you're, you've also been sold this idea that these people that you're working with are the ones who are the key to your success. And, you know, a lot of models come from backgrounds, and they may be the ones who are financially supporting their families. So there's a huge pressure on them not to mess up in that moment and not to lose out on a single opportunity to be rebooked and to have this ascendant career, which is what everyone's banking on. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that's the bind that a lot of models are in day to day. Um, but, you know, p another part of that, which I also want to quickly mention, is the fact that when you hand over your body, the normal kind of social etiquette of how you're treated physically goes out the window, and those boundaries bet between one person and another are totally transgressed. So it would be totally no normal for a stylist to walk over to you, to put their hands up your skirt and pull your shirt down, to tuck it in more smoothly, and that is normal. But in any other situation, that's totally abnormal. Yeah, and I also realized, I, you know, the same thing, you work in a business and you do this all the time and behavior becomes normalized, mm. but even this year with the, uh, just getting uh, private changing rooms for the first time ever, like, it just, you know, you don't realize that one day you're in a cornfield in Minnesota and the next day you're standing in a room with no clothes on and really no direction, but, you know, and we think that's normal, but it's not normal, and I think recently a lot of these, these super personal things where, uh, where this abuse actually occurs in private and quiet is, it's, it's finally been addressed. And Sarah, you made a documentary regarding this whole, this whole, because you as well, you were in the same, you were in the same position, which uh, prompted you to create the Model Alliance. But being that you and Edie are from different eras has, I mean, I feel like there's been a drastic change in the last 10 years, but I, obviously some of the same behaviors were there before. And what was your, I mean, obviously it was your experience that made you create the documentary. Yeah. Well, so the Model Alliance grew out of my and other models experiences working in the industry. And I'm the first to say I have had a good career. Um, I've been relatively fortunate, um, but I also experienced some of the pitfalls of working in what is largely an unregulated industry. And that is why I joined forces with other models and uh, full disclosure, you know, James is involved, he's on our advisory board. Um, and, uh, and we set out to really give models a voice in their work. Um, we truly believe that change comes not from the top down, from, but from the bottom up. And um, so we uh, established child labor laws uh, in New York State where there were none, you know, it's strange to think we're the most visible people in the supply chain mm. um, and a appear to be the most privileged and yet we didn't even have basic labor protections in in New York City. Um, and just to sort of to explain kind of how this situation happened um, and is, is really that um, in the last 10 years, you know, uh, because of all of these public companies uh, that were hiring designers, uh, uh, what happened with the business is there used to be three or four seasons a year, and then you would get a designer that comes in and has four collections a year, plus prefall, plus crews, plus men's, plus children's, and they, they started to have to hire outside help. And the problem was basically it was the outside help that basically was, you know, they weren't behaving like employees of the company. Basically, these were people who were being hired by these companies and using those companies as sort of a nameplate for their own for their own reputations, and it's basically how this abuse started, because as you said, the minute you hand yourself over to these people, you're in their hands, and most people aren't really sensitive enough to realize that it's an actual person that's in the room with them. Right, and so this is very much a, 
a labor rights issue. And you know, when I first thought about forming the Model Alliance, I, I approached established unions and asked them if they would extend membership to us. Um, because, for the most part, we're working as independent contractors, not employees, we're unable to unionize, so the Model Alliance was the next best thing. And um, today, I'm actually very proud to announce that we are introducing the RESPECT program, which is uh, an industry-wide initiative which is uh, designed for and by the models themselves. Um, I took out a, a cue out of your book, um, <laughs> James, and right before we walked on stage, I posted on Instagram an open letter from me and over 100 <laughs> other models calling for uh, agencies, publishing companies, and brands to join this initiative, which will foster meaningful accountability in the industry. And um, I don't want to dominate too much, but I do think it's important for us to talk about what does real and lasting change look like. We don't think that voluntary corporate social responsibility initiatives, as well-meaning as they, as they are, are going to address the, issue, the outstanding issues which remain in the supply chain. We work with a complex network of you know, brands, agencies, models, freelance, stylists, hairdressers, uh, photographers, and so on. And unless everyone is working together and everyone is educated on their rights and their responsibilities, um, then I don't think that we're going to really see a significant change. Um, so I'd just like to sort of put that out there that I and numerous other models are inviting um, companies across the fashion industry to, to join us in this effort. And that brings me to you, Marie-Claire, because <laughs> it's actually <Thank> going to... <laughs> this, ultimately, what this will do, if all goes well you know, down the road, is um, it will kind of hold, to start with, modeling agencies accountable. And um, what I'm initially trying to do is stop the flow of models from unscrupulous agencies and countries that shouldn't be in the business because they're not prepared and they've not been trained. So ultimately what this would do is if we're working with some of the big, we're already talking to some of the bigger networks like the Elite Network and the Women Network, which have agencies all over the world, it's basically a way for a model to see and a client or a, 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 a group, a caring group, to understand that uh, these are basically gold star agencies. And if you work within this framework, we will only work with you, which basically cuts half of the girls that are coming to Paris or coming to Milan that shouldn't be there in the first place. But um, what some of the people don't realize is that um, the carrying LVMH, uh, the uh, charter actually happened in less than four months. And one of the things that I've taken away from watching these, uh, all of these panels is that you pretty much have a bunch of people that are sitting here together and saying, we're all on the same page, but we're waiting for one person to jump and make, and we'll all shake hands and we'll, and we'll do it together. And uh, basically the fact that in less than four months, we had two rival, <laughs> rival brands that couldn't even sit in the room with each other actually sit down and discuss to, how to do the right thing. Because at this point, if these girls were being abused <laughs> by freelancers, that if they were actually m employees of your company, they'd be fired, they'd be arrested. They're, I mean, some of the, the, you know, the injustices are just incredible. But um, what you've been able to do in such a short time was basically bring many, many brands together and get them all to agree to this, to this charter. And just for the people out here that are already experiencing, like, we're all ready to jump, but the one person ha doesn't do it, how could you even tell one of these people the first thing you did just to start these companies? Perhaps to answer your point, James, I think it's interesting to, to share with uh, the audience uh, what is the history beyond, because if we, I speak for, uh, for caring, we have a lot of commitment in the women field, uh, from the human resources policy, through our caring foundation to fight violence against women. And uh, also, for example, because uh, it's, uh, it's happening now uh, at the Festival de Cannes, we have women in motion. And of course, we were very sensitive to the issue of uh, fashion model linked with women and men, because please don't forget also that during the fashion show and the shooting, we have men. So if we want to promote gender parity, it's also to pay attention to, to men. 
And uh, what we were thinking with uh, François-Henri is the fact uh, that, of course, people were aware about the issue. Uh, they were paying attention about the topic, but the thing uh, were not changing enough uh, quickly. So that's why we decided uh, to write a charter, and that's why we decided also to do it in comment with uh, the LVMH group. And I can tell you that we don't have so many topics where you yes. have LVMH <laughs> and caring with the same press release. So I think also because we have a, su a sustainability uh, topics to, to speak during the, the Fashion Copenhagen Summit, <coughs> it shows that when you have topics like that, you can go beyond the competition and you can work very closely. So also for me, it's important. And uh, we wanted to work together to say, if we want to change the entire industry, because I think it's also a question of mindset, it's a question of culture, we have to work together. And that's why we decided to write this charter, and we didn't write by ourselves. We, you know, because thanks to you, uh, James, and, and what you did, we were able to, to build a steering committee where we had uh, fashion model, uh, agencies, but also casting director. Because like in the supply chain, it's not the, only the responsibility of a group of, of a brand, but it's really the ecosystem we have to change. And where I am very happy, to be honest with you, when I decided to work on this topic inside the caring group, some people told me it will be impossible. But in the luxury world, it's like that. You take fashion model under 16 years old. And what I can say, after two fashion weeks, now it's obvious for people not to take, uh, I will say children, uh, under 16 years old, that wearing adults ready to wear. Of course, uh, I'd like to shoot for over 18 down the, <laughs> down the road. That would be my dream. But. No, but it's also obvious uh, to be sure that uh, people uh, are uh, well treated and we pay attention to the well-being. But for me, what, uh, where I am the most impressed is by the fact that if you want, you can change quickly the culture. And the most important is to change the culture. So after, you can put criteria as like we did to be sure that uh, you have a medical certificate uh, with validated uh, less than six months. So you can put many, many technical criteria, but the most important for me is to be sure that you, you change the culture. And I am very happy to, to tell you that inside caring, it was something very easy to implement from the designer side, but also from the CEO. So also uh, from our uh, external partners, like uh, casting directors, like uh, model agencies, we say, if you don't respect uh, the charter, we stop to work with you. Because I think uh, we can't negotiate when it's about uh, the well-being of uh, people. So we were very clear, saying, of course, we will work with you to, to be aware about your issue and to find some solutions. But if you explain that it's impossible, sorry, we can continue uh, to work with you. Mm. So for me, the next step, and I am happy to have this kind of uh, audience today, it's really to say, please join us, please uh, join uh, the charter. Uh, we are all citizens of the world. Uh, you have the power inside your company, uh, you have the power inside your brands to decide that we want to stop and we want to apply this kind of criteria. Of course, you can make also suggestions about other criteria, but at least to say we want to act together because, again, to change the industry, we need to work all together, casting director uh, and... No, and I agree. The, the, the most impressive change was to literally be in a business that was like the Wild West and literally in six months. I mean, unfortunately, it was terrible that we had to get to the point to basically have people know you're being watched, but it literally turned the industry inside and it changed the culture of the industry. And I, the thing that was most surprising to me was um, there are obviously people who feel like this doesn't affect them and this, it's not them <laughs> doing this. And then there were other people who I found to be some of the biggest defenders in the business to really write me letters and say, I had no, I, I didn't realize I turned into this person now and you actually made me want to be more respectful and a better person than I am. And a lot of those stylists that are actually working behind the scenes and some of the casting directors to get, to get things moving forward. But um, ultimately, 
I do think, as I lead into a last question, because we don't have very much time, and it's so hard to <laughs> kind of explain what the last 18 months has been like, but um, I, I, at this point, I do believe now that Me Too is a cultural fit, uh, shift. And to quote Gloria Steinem, for the first time, in story, uh, first time in history, not only these stories of harassment and abuse are being told, for the first time in history, they're actually being believed. And I do think sometimes that society as a whole is feeling overwhelmed by what they see as a bombardment of almost unbelievable tidal flow of people sharing their abuses on a daily level. And it leads the court of public opinion to question the validity of these stories. And uh, on a personal level, if I can try and make you understand from the point of view that of the people that this has happened to, um, one of the things that upsets me the most just about the criticism of Me Too, the people discrediting me for what we did, is that, um, uh, and it's always an angry question. It's what, you know, why, you know, why did you wait so long? Why did you wait so long? Like, what does it mean now? And, you know, what I can only say is if you've never been abused or you've never been assaulted, you can't answer that question and you have no right to ask anyone for a time frame or to deliver an answer that will satisfy them in a box because it's not, that's not how it works. Everything is not black and white. And, um, you know, even the other cliche that I really hate are all these people that say, oh, all these actresses in Hollywood and these mid-level office workers and male models decide one day they're just going to sleep with people for their careers. And to be quite honest, if I asked any of you in the room if you would sleep with someone for a job, I know what your answer would be. And the assumption that these people go out and do this and this is how they get work is a complete misnomer because if you realize that someone would, to be quite honest, no one should ever go onto a job where sex is put on the table. It's just not, it's not a reality. And uh, what's sad is that if someone really felt that was their only way to survive and comply, that was not a, that was not a work decision. It was your decision being taken away from you. Mm -hmm. And what, if I can really, if I can really impart one thing on behalf of all the kids who've sort of been tossed out in this business is that, um, uh, the question about abuse has to be now asked and reversed because you have to stop asking people why did you wait so long when the real answer to that question is why did we wait so long and turn our heads and watch this disaster happen and do nothing about it? And that, ultimately, now that we know this information, I really hope we can go forward and make sure that this never happens again. Um, but it's, you know, as you know, there are still people in these groups that are bad children and misbehave, but, you know, behind the scenes, it's pretty amazing that there are people that will now speak up and stop what's going on. But, um, uh, some, you know, what makes me feel, you know, what's also upsetting is when someone as powerful as Karl Lagerfeld can literally discount a movement with one quip and deny everyone their abuse. <laughs> it makes me worry, you know, and he could, people like that can change the tide of opinion. So I worry, you know, that there's going to be me, food, me too fatigue. So my question to you, you know, is how do we, what can we do to go forward to actually get past what everyone is calling a witch hunt and, you know, a cattle call, which is totally not true, to actually get the message of moving forward? I mean, I think it, it says everything that we've heard crickets from the vast majority of people in the fashion industry in response to Karl Lagerfeld making disgusting remarks um, in response to the Me Too movement and models very legitimate concerns about their safety on the job. Um, and I don't think that we're going to see meaningful, lasting change until companies, if they're really serious about preventing abuse, are willing to make that commitment, enter a legally binding commitment to no longer work with harassers, to ensure education of all parties, <laughs> to have a a confidential uh, complaint mechanism so that models can bring forward their concerns without worrying about retaliation, um, so that there are independent investigations to follow up on these complaints. You need all of the ingredients to address these concerns, and that is precisely what the RESPECT program offers. Mm. Um, but we can't just have, this can't be about, you know, uh, this is not about managing a PR crisis. This is about remi remedying the, si the problem. I think the other point to make is that a program like yours doesn't necessarily need to limit people's <coughs> ability to make beautiful images, design incredible clothes. It doesn't need to limit anybody's creativity. Right. It's not about stopping people from doing the job that they love. It's about just 
taking the kind of the fear and the ego and the aggression and the violence out of it, and then it carries on. And if you have an independent auditor and you have a system, it can happen, it can flow, it can go easily. It doesn't need to be this kind of heart-wrenching, really difficult thing that everyone is going to agonise over whether they're going to commit to. It's, you know, it's a big commitment, but it doesn't need to be a terrifying one. I will be perhaps uh, a little bit more positive when I see between September 2017 and today the huge changes we have. I think that, of course, it's not perfect. I think we have a lot of work uh, to do yeah. and to continue. That's why we put in place a steering committee. But I can't tell you, perhaps I make a, a mistake, but there is, uh, there is a huge uh, change in the way that people speak about the topic. Only here, look, uh, Copenhagen Fashion Summit, it's a great place to speak about sustainability. I think that it's the first time that we are speaking about the well-being of fashion model. So my only uh, advice on that, it's really to say, uh, after this, uh, this uh, panel, everyone can do something concretely when he go back uh, to his brand, uh, to our brand, and to say, please, we have to pay attention to this topic. You mentioned the supply chain. It's the same spirit for the other uh, supplier. We put sustainability criteria and we pay attention. So for the fashion uh, world, like uh, fashion models, like uh, casting directors, you only work with people who are of the same spirit of you and they want really to continue uh, changes. But we have also to accept that to change a culture, it takes, uh, it takes time. So no, that's why I, I, I trust that we will be able to, to do no. it and thanks to the social media, because I think no. also social media gives the opportunity to know exactly what is happening. And fashion models can also yep. express what, uh, what is happening. So thanks but, to that, and uh, yeah. so it's a it's great opportunity to continue to move. But I would add that sexual harassment doesn't exist in a vacuum. When you are uh, not being paid for your work, when you're waiting as much as six months to a year to be paid for a job, whether it's because the, the client is slow to pay or the agency is withholding your funds, which, let's be honest, happens in our <laughs> business, if you're not at the top 1%, um, you know, there's a huge amount of economic abuse that's going on that makes people even more vulnerable <coughs> to harassment and assault. So we, our program is really looking at this holistically um, in terms of education, in terms of having a, a confidential complaint mechanism, in terms of um, actually holding companies to, to these commitments to change the work environment. Um, and, and I think that if we're really going to see meaningful, lasting change, it can't come from the top down. It has to come from the bottom up. And we're, in, we're inviting leading companies to actually help, you know, help with the enforcement power that's needed behind that. Okay, well, we have to end this, but one final question. Me too, a moment or a movement? Yeah, I hope a movement. <laughs> movement, absolutely. Movement. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for having us. Yeah.